navigating the professional world can be as challenging as a Rubik's Cube. And yes, I'm showing my age with this sentence. But I am beyond excited to introduce our latest episode of the podcast. And this is featuring the incredibly talented Isabel Sachs. Let me tell you a bit more about Isabel if you don't know her. She is the founder of I Like Networking, and we are diving into the heart of starting your creative career and unlocking the strategies to thrive in a very competitive space. As the founder of I Like Networking, Isabel is a big of inspiration, especially in the creative industry. And she will share her journey and the essential skills that helped her forge a path to success, both with her current business, but also with her extensive career in the creative space. Another worry thing, in 2021, she was also listed as one of the top 21 most influential women by Style Magazine. And she won the DNAD award on the side hustle category. Without further ado, meet our dear friend Isabel. It was an absolute blast. And yes, we talked a lot about one particular thing in pop culture that we all love. Guess what it is? Well, we'll dive straight into it. So let's kick off today's class. Isabel, I have a confession to make, just to start off right. Okay. <laughs> Go on. I am obsessed with the memes that cleverly, mm. <laughs> she knows what I'm talking about, mm. uh, Isabel and mm. I like networking puts on Instagram to make sure that then people scroll through the opportunities. Mm-hmm. So the little Twitter memes, uh, which will be very relatable if you go to Instagram, which you can find in the show notes or Instagram, you will find them. So my question is, the secret, this question is, how the hell do you find them? Do you actually have some time in your agenda that is like, make sure that you have enough funny Twitter relatable things that I can put on my memes or they just kind of magically appear? What's the vibe? It's very important, memes, you know? So, you know how people follow different things on instagram i guess so people follow fitness influencers like whatever i have like i have the other working instagram which is like professional and then my private instagram it's literally like 50 meme pages like comedians and gossip about anything that's like bravo shows because i i have like i love pop culture but especially sort of like not super how can i say this in a nice way like not even like the top pop culture stuff maybe like some weird pop culture like references and things and tv shows like you know if there was like celebrity that's the class like class a celebrities i'm into like class d celebrities sort of um and i love memes and i laugh i love like people in the internet are really funny like anything that happens like three seconds later there will be someone turning something like into a joke like there is this woman who is a journalist and she was commentating on the the whole situation in the u.s with the house with the speaker of the house of not being able to appoint someone but he was using a bunch of memes to explain it and it was fascinating so i just think comedy (laughs) is good you know it's also sometimes making a bit of fun of like the things that sort of like everyone goes through it's kind of it's kind of entertaining it's all very light fun it's nothing like intense but i just find it fascinating so i basically only save this type of content on my personal account and then when i see something that might be good for island at working i just send it to my other account <laughs> but i love it i think it's really funny and i People enjoy it, you know, like you had, it's like Monday morning is when we do the creative opportunities roundup. So it's good to start with a laugh, you know, you might as well, if you're leaving your house <laughs> and you got to go to work, you might as well have a little joke with you. I don't know. Just, it's entertaining. Um, but yeah, my friends make really like every time I post anything of quality on my Instagram, they're like, stop that. Where are the memes? And so they expect that from me at this point. Um, so yeah, that's my, my thing. I almost don't follow humans on Instagram. It's literally like meme accounts, random Bravo celebrities. Uh, yeah, I found this like a uh, guy called Blake Lee Torton or something. He's hilarious. He makes like the best short 
videos on anything. He just made one recently about the potential new like people to play James Bond, and it's just really funny. I don't know. I it's it's good. It's so yeah. I always tell people like you need to follow people that bring you something. You know, either insights or joy or connection. If it's not one of those, don't have that in your feed. Because we're all going to be addicted to our phones anyway. You might as well do it in a nice, nicer way, I guess. But yeah, that's the secret. I love that. One of um, my friends, uh, one of my, my husband's friends, she does memes on a Thursday and on a Monday. And uh, it's very much if, especially the, the Thursday ones, if they're not happening on Thursday, she says that she receives messages from people being like, are you okay? Yeah. So it's kind of funny that it becomes their little appointment. And like, I would be probably potentially be one of these people that will send the message being like, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. Is everything okay? And I, I love the fact that you said like kind of surrounding ourselves in the online world with things that bring us joy as well. And I will yeah. be honest, this is not just to tooth your horn because you're here. Um, but just to give some context for our listener. So one of the reasons why Isabel is here with us as well, obviously been following the work at Light Networking for a very long time. Then a common friend, one of our advisors, Raz, put us in touch. And um, overall, I just um, I just love what you did. So I just got in touch and we found a way to, again, I'm going to say collaborate together. You talked about mm-hmm. collaborations before we jumped on this chat. And we found a simple, a couple of simple ways um, to collaborate. And you said as well that for other collaborations, you found that one of the beautiful things about some of these things is that, you know, you can do a lot more with a lot less work. And the reason why it really jumped out at me to talk to you is because I've been following our light networking for a very long time. And I love that everything you do is very much serving clearly the creatives in a way that is just giving them opportunities, is giving them ideas, is giving them support to take the next step. And I find that this kind of work is amazing, but it also can take so much. And obviously that's why I'm kind of want to be, before we get into class in session, Mm -hmm. uh, the next section, I just wanted to chip away a tiny bit more and ask you a bit about about that, about, you know, the the line of work when it comes to unlike networking, how you're finding the balance between obviously giving so much. We talk a lot about giving in this podcast, funnily enough, because obviously it's all about marketing to hearts. But obviously being able also to run the business, to run the work and to make sure that, you know, uh, you can grow and scale without kind of going absolutely berserk because that's what we're all trying to do. Obviously doing better for others, but also be kinder to ourselves. So how do you find the balance where everything that you do is so much about giving and about supporting others? Yeah. Um, I So it's funny, like I, I am someone that I think uh, throughout my professional life has worked a lot to sort of support almost other people's dreams. Like I started working when I was 17, sort of in the creative industry. And then when I opened my first company in Brazil, I was quite young. I was like in my early 20s. I don't remember. It was a while ago. But when uh, when we did that, it um, I think I was like 23, maybe or 24. But basically i only felt confident to do this i think because the artists that were around me that i was going to represent and produce their work i really trusted their vision so i used to joke that my company was actually like their names dreams and enterprises it was like half us dreams and enterprises because they would tell me like we have this idea and i'd be like oh my god yes and for a long time that would drive me you know to see that we could do that and realize that artistic vision for someone else and obviously see the impact it has on audiences. So I think I need a bit of that feedback to realize that the work that I'm doing is doing something positive, not just, you know, to the world in a little way. I always felt like I was, I don't know, that was part of my job as a human to do that. I have a, my great uncle was someone who's like very idealistic and I think he fought for most of his life for a better world. And I he's someone that I really always looked up to. And he worked in a in different space. He was much more like in politics and policy and the sort of sustainable development uh, world. And his wife was a literature professor and also an incredible supporter of other people's dreams. And so I think they they were really formative in my life. So that was always kind of part of my 
understanding like if you get to choose what you're gonna do you might as well do something that's sort of positive if you can that said it is it is really easy to let yourself be taken advantage of not ju- not by other people but almost by yourself you know because you're you get a little addicted as well to the feeling like you're it's like you attach a lot of value your value to providing value to other people and that i think to me that balance was the hardest to detach from from understanding that my professional self has its place but my other self everything else that makes who i am has value on its own inherently but so i think that was that's been like a big it's not an easy thing to achieve i think it's an ongoing conversation but with island working it was born out of a necessity at a time like it was born in cult during covid and once that and it kept changing or evolving into something else because it was never born to be a company. It was never born to be anything. It was going to be a one-off thing that was three months and that would it be it. And it took a lot of my life by storm. And I I had to kind of confront the fact, and we were just talking about this before the podcast started, that I can't be everything for everyone. Like no one can. So I that that is something that now that I'm older and have had a company before and all of that, I have that vision of like, okay, there's, you know, this is the remit. This is what we can do for people. And outside of that, what we can do is potentially signpost to other organizations and other resources, because there's a lot of, there's a big need for support in many different areas of our lives. But if we're talking just about the creative career industry in the UK, there's tons of different needs. There are tons of different groups that need very specific type of support. And I think most organizations that are trying to address that are doing it in slightly different ways, which means that they are going to support some people, but not others. And you just have to kind of accept that. And yeah, when you're really tired, if you have nothing in the tank, you can give anything to anyone else either. So yeah, it's a lot of breathing and not responding to things right away, which I used to do when I was younger. Now I'm a lot more like, this is not open heart surgery. Everything will be fine. But like. people can. And it's hard to be. Sometimes people can wait when you see that email. You're like, I could respond right now, but I find that for me as well, being a bit of a practice of like, I'm just gonna let this simmer unless is you know is something that is very timely. It can also sets expectations because if we are always on the pulse, it's great. But then in the other person said, that's kind of how things feel. And mm-hmm. I am the first person to be very squirrel head, so I need to literally go and dive deep into that. And I want to jump on one more thing before we get into the main crux of this chat, which it's kind of similar to what you did. And just to bring our own experience to the table briefly, I almost gave up on the scholarships for our cohorts, which was really painful because the whole idea of the scholarships is to tap into making marketing more accessible for everybody. That's literally a big value for us. But being very honest, because sake of honesty, dear listener, you know, that's how we roll. I am still on my own, at least at the time of recording, and I was on my own then. And I was swifting through applications for paid students and um, these complementary applications. And it was quite a few. And the first round, we had about 20. The second round, we were kind of averaging around the 30 just for that. And I had to stop and be like, I I genuinely can't do this because I'm already doing all the course for the other things. I have to vet. There's an extra element of vetting and understanding and identifying. And it was really painful because I was like, I need to run this thing. and I don't even have the time to look at everything that is coming my way. And so that's where I started and to reach out to people with a couple of alumni that came up first and other people as well. And being, we would love to give your community that aligns with our mm-hmm. value. They have the needs that they, we need some spots if you can help us amplify it and also just kind of helping us refine, you know, the, the candidates together um, and in different varieties and in different like level of commitment. And I love what you said as well. It's just understanding also how, what I really like when it comes to partnerships and collaboration is meeting people where they're at. If somebody's really busy, I'm like, okay, which kind of work can you do? And I can take on the rest, but even just offloading some of that, how that work means that we were able to then continue this side of the business that I really wanted to have. And I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself. I wouldn't like, now I have seven cohorts and every single cohort had at least 50% of our students so far have been from scholarships, different types of scholarships, including the ones that we have with our partners. And that's amazing. And I wouldn't have been able to do that on my own. So sometimes it's that reminder that, as you say, 
and I love that you said that, it can get really addictive to give because I see the experience that we have with our students, which I want to say, the lovely students that came from you, they all graduated. We have some lovely pictures. I'll send it to you later on. And they Yay. were super happy. And, you know, and then that's the thing that we all feel happy. We see they were making a difference. And sometimes it's hard to be like, okay, wait a second, but how can I make things smarter for myself? So thank you for mentioning that because it's yeah. when you are naturally a giver, when you naturally want to make that difference and people around you, as you say, inspired you to do that, it's almost half the battle not to kind of go back to that too. With that in mind, I actually wanted to get into the class in session and I wanted to focus on one area that for me is really important to talk about at the beginning of 2024, at time of coming out, that's when it's going to come out. Because I don't think putting my predictive hat on, Isabella, I got plenty. I don't think the things are going to change as much when it comes to people finding new opportunity to get into the creative space. Yeah, I personally have found, so I want to set the scene, so I would like to ask your opinion on this. I personally have found that just working with some of our students that are looking for a career in marketing and also changing jobs as well, with a couple of those as well, has been really, really tough and really overwhelming. And I wanted to hear from another community, which is much bigger than ours, what has also been some of the feedback that you have gotten from your own community, just to set the scene about some of the things that we can teach them and help them with when it comes to breaking into this space and industry if you're just starting out. Yeah, well, I I I, I literally posted about this, I think, on LinkedIn maybe a few weeks ago. So if, when this comes out, it's going to be a few months ago. But yeah. It's very tricky because when we describe, when people say the creative industries in the UK, it also involves things like IT, tech, software. Like it is not, it's a very big beast that have very different types of companies. So comparing, for instance, the theater industry to the film and TV complex industry, they're already completely different in size, in scale, in you know, purchase power and salary ranges and what type of skills you need. It's insane. Then you, you know, then there was like this big service of research, like, oh, one in five jobs in London are now in the creative industries. Yeah, but they were mostly in IT and software, which are things that fine, but that's not what a lot of the community that I work with wants to do or even thinks they can do. Because I think that is one of the, the things, right? People don't really understand what the possibilities are. And this industry changes so fast. I always give this example. When I started working in the music industry in 2009 or something, we didn't, have, we didn't use Spotify. There was no such thing as thinking about music downloads. Like you, we were like still recording and selling CDs and live DVDs. That was like a big product to sell. Like you would go to the store and put your CD and DVD in it. Like, you know, it was a completely different ball game. Like things change so fast. Like now, if anyone wants to work in the music industry, you'll, you'll learn, you'll know a lot about data, about algorithms and about how that all works, you know, other types of royalties and rights. So it is, I think everyone needs to understand if they're coming to the industry, one, that it's huge. There's a lot of potential, but two. Not, you know, you can't just take everyone's uh, like big stats or big experiences like that as the rule, because when you start to look at the nitty gritty of things, depending on the subsector you want to be in, that's going to be different because you can also do marketing for a big organization that is not creative in itself, but that's still a creative job. So I would say to the first thing is to definitely try, and this is hard, but to not try, try not to compare too much your journey with someone else's because there's not such thing as like a one path for things. Like it is, there is no potential. Like there are of course some traineeship schemes in, in different things, but for most of the people that I know and most of the people in the community, their career is a little like up and down and then diagonal and then a bit back. And it's like a, it's a game. So, but I, I agree that especially for certain groups, of the population, it's tricky, you know, like there was this whole thing in 2020 on, I don't know, Black Lives Matter and la la la, and, you know, we're all defending like gender equity and equal pay, you know, and you still see that this is huge. The gap is still big in certain areas. It got worse instead of getting better. Um, Vogue Business did a huge 
research a few months ago as well on the state of the fashion business and how most people who identify as black or they don't basically who are not like straight, able-bodied, white people didn't really feel like they could belong or there were many choices. And now there was this big scandal that everybody in the caring group, all the creative directors are white men. So there's still a bit, a lot to go. So I guess all of that rent is to just con put this into context and to say that if you want to get a career in the creative industry, it's amazing. One thing is that you're going to have to fight hard because it's very competitive and it's sadly not the most open in terms of how you don't really understand what you need to do sometimes like or where you need to go it's not always that transparent which is something we try to change but the second thing is i think there's a lot of talk about imposter syndrome but sometimes you will be facing systemic barriers it's not just all on you so you have to go in doing your absolute best but definitely go and find people to be in your corner, find a community because it can be really tricky, you know, even when you're in it to navigate, to get out from one side to the other, to pivot, you know, you're going to hit hurdles that everybody hits in careers all over the world. But yeah, you definitely have to be resilient. But final addendum of all of this, I think starting out your career in any sector with maybe very rare exceptions it's very hard you know you hear i hear a lot of podcasts i listen to a lot of podcasts that are not about the creative industries i like to listen to different things i love listening to things about tech and about businesses and entrepreneurship and then sports and gossip and things like that so but i just think it's important to read and hear stories from different worlds because you might get ideas and you also learn a lot from other things but uh there was this one podcast and I don't know, it was a guy who was, so it was a guy graduating from a top university in the US in business, trying to get into finance or whatever. One of those things where you imagine like smooth sailing and he was getting rejected right, left and center. And the person who was responding was like, well, that's kind of how it is. Like it's tough, you know? So remember that this is not just on you or just not on the creative industries. Of course, we have specific barriers in our industry and any specific issues, but I think getting into something else in something in new industry or getting your first job, it's always hard. It's not impossible, but it's always a bit tricky. So it gets easier, I think, once you're in it. But yeah, you gotta push a bit. So breathe in and go on. I love that. And one of the things that really resonates with me looking at having been in marketing for 15 years is how much things have changed. Uh, and con continuously change. And also that can feel sometimes the hurdle of being, you know, do I know enough or is this where I want to go when things change, skill sets, needs and things like that. And it's really funny because you made me think about the fact that in 20, so as some of the dear listeners that have been quite loyal will know, I used to be a music journalist, but also I started as a music PR, like an, an internship. And I remember that the most cutting edge thing in 2011 everybody was sending soundcloud samples to the magazines instead yes. of sending the actual cds that was cutting edge so just to give an idea and now we're looking at things that were like for any kind of creative industry as you say the skill sets are different and the priorities are different and the needs are different um but this is why i guess i wanted to go into the class in session with this so thank you so much for all of the nuggets as well and i wanted to ask you we're going to give you one minute i know what is the one thing that you can teach our students or listeners in one minute or so when it comes to, once again, breaking into or just kind of working inside the creative industry? One thing that they can think about, as well as all the wonderful things that you said already before. Well, I, I, the one thing that I think I, maybe I can teach, but also that everyone should have, to, in my opinion, is the most important thing to define if you're going to succeed or not, one of the most important things is proactiveness and showing that. And I think that is a really important skill to, to have in, in life for anything you're going to do. Do I have to yes. explain how? You tell me. I love that. And yes, we can go to the follow-up <laughs> bit. Hope. Follow-up bit. Love that. Yeah. Give us, can you give us maybe 
a couple of examples that you would think like that you've seen that you count as that proactiveness because I know there are so many. Yeah, I think it it really I've seen I mean I, I am from Brazil, so uh and my family is very mixed, but like uh in terms of nationalities and backgrounds, oops. So everyone was a lot of people were raised in slightly different ways, but I was really brought up to the to realize to to learn that you sort of have to make your own path. And when I was starting out in my career, I didn't know anything. I remember I had this uh, boss and she told me like, oh, we're, someone is producing this, I don't know, theater production, et cetera. Do you want to go be the assistant producer? And I said, oh, I've only been like production assistant and blah, blah, blah. I have never been like the most important like on set for this. And she's like, you're never going to learn unless you try it. So you're going to F up, but you have to be confident that you can then address what you F up and still make it happen in the rest. Like, so just go and figure it out. And that was an amazing thing because I was petrified, but I was just doing it and I was moving. And I think this is very important. Being proactive is about trying to find solutions to problems. Like, on your own and understanding that you can find solutions, but some, and sometimes the solution is not all depending on you. And I think this is really key. Sometimes the solution is like calling someone asking for like advice, like figuring out, like going and Googling, like a YouTube tutorial, like figuring a few things out. But if you show to anyone you're working with that you can problem solve on the go, that you can figure things out for yourself up to a limit, and then you maybe have to show this to them, you're gonna be like so much better, I guess, of the competition. Because first, it's really, it's really great when we figure things out for ourselves. Like it is, especially when I was starting out, I would, I would feel so proud when I managed a big problem. I would be like, oh my God, I solved this, you know, like, or I figured this out, like whatever it was, it was really exciting. Gives you a lot of confidence as well. So I think it works in many ways. And depending on where you grew up or what type of, you know, education system you have, because I've seen this be quite different and also what type of boss you've had before. Maybe you have been told to not even try it. But in my opinion, once you try to figure out problems and you are proactive around finding solutions to things, that's your first question. When when you see a problem and something goes out wrong, instead of saying, oh my God, who is at blame? Or are they going to blame me? Just think about like, how can I solve this? Or like, how can I get the closest to a solution? Because it's all you can do really, right? Like pointing to people and saying what the problem is doesn't help anyone, especially when you're like, I worked a lot in live events, so you don't have time to do that. You need to figure that out right now. So it was a really good experience, terrifying, but yeah, when you're on the, like the goal, uh, it was really good. So I'd say do that. You can do that in your life, in your day-to-day life with things like, I don't know, you really want to, I don't know, build, uh, like buy this new furniture and you don't know you're going to be able to assemble it yourself. Try, you know, if you can't at all, then you call someone, but like, do you do your best, like learn how to do this because we learn how to do things on our own all the time. Like once you, when you first get your first flat that you share with a friend, you're learning a lot of things, you know, you're figuring it out usually on your own. Like the first time you do your laundry all on your own, when you're like, I don't know how years old. So all those things are important for you. It's just, we need to apply the same for our careers. So I'd say that that is a really good skill to have. And especially if you're an entrepreneur or you're a freelancer, this is like life or death, you know, for your business. I love that. Um, It reminds me of an example that I think we've already made on the pod. So that I think is so great. And sometimes it's similar, but different on top of the proactiveness, which also comes with time because then you get more confidence to try and solve other problems that maybe you didn't even think you could before. But also is that balance between pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and obviously being realistic about what you can do. Case in point, one of our clients for the agency, just to give you a, a tangible example, they said, oh, could you please do a whole audit? 
of our MailChimp and sort it out. And I've been working with ConvertKit as an email marketing platform for seven years. I know MailChimp, but I haven't, I hadn't touched it for a while then. So I came in and it all made sense. And I was like, it might take me a bit longer. It might take me a couple of chats with support if something is not super clear. But it's a bit outside of my comfort zone because I will need to learn a few new things, like some e-commerce sides of things that I didn't know. But I know I can do it. And I think that gave me the confidence to be like, yeah, I can do this. It might mm-hmm. take me a bit longer than I would like because I'm not 100% sure of all of it. But it's something that I know I can add to my skill set and it can challenge me a bit. And I know yeah. that in another conversation that we had with Rochelle Robertson, one of our graduates, she said that so many people, which I'm sure is a stat that you also know, don't even, especially women, I will, I will say, don't apply for jobs unless they know 100% of the skills. And, yeah. you know, I know a couple of other male friends that have the same. And that's the thing, 70%, 50% can be enough if you're willing to learn the rest. And I think we don't talk about that enough. So that is not the proactiveness, but that came to mind when you talked about that too, you know? No, but it is It is really about that. It's about showing that you're going to hit the ground running. And that means that this is what I know and this is what I don't know, but this is how I intend on learning this. Or this is how I intend on fixing this skill set that I'm lacking, you know? And that that can also mean like uh, saying to people, listen, I am dyslexic, so it's hard for me to, you know, I don't know, spot typos in copy. So the way that I get around this, if this is part of your job, is then make sure that there's someone else in the team that can review things with you and have this thing or that process that you don't need to do everything in like two hours, that you have at least like an hour break between like versions, et cetera, et cetera. So you create a system which also may well involve other people. So being proactive doesn't mean being an island that does everything yourself because no one can do that. But it is about finding the solutions, even if the solution is delegating, finding someone else, asking for support, you know, building a little community around you. Those are all solutions, but it's something that you're initiating as well, right? It's not just like waiting like, oh, no one told me what to do, so I didn't do anything. So that, I think that attitude is not helpful, whereas everything else that you do is better. And like asking for help, learning that you need help and being able to ask for it, that's also being bragged. <laughs> you know, it's not just like pretending that the problem isn't there. And that's I very think, true. Yeah. That's actually very, very true. And I, I, I think, I love that you mentioned that because my next question, uh, two out of three is about something you learned from somebody else. So I wanted to ask you, especially again, when it comes to the work that you're doing now, but maybe even in the past, you mentioned some old bosses. Is that, uh, it can be a tactic, it can be a framework, it can be maybe like a, a mindset even that somebody else taught you. So something that you learned from someone else that really stood out to you when it came to, I'm going to say your journey and your career. Yeah, I had, well, my, so I started university at 17 and I got a, a two week like placement doing something. And then I got a six month paid internship at sort of this third sector organization that worked sort of at arm's length of this, you know, organization, commercial organization. So the job itself was pretty dull because, you know, it's not great. It was in an office, it was like very traditional, the nine to five, the office clothes, like I felt like a clown, uh, but I attempted. But I had the absolute best boss, like what have I best I had two really great bosses and um she said something to me that since that day I've applied for everybody that I've ever worked with and then I feel it's really great so one thing I'm gonna have to say too so one thing that she used to do is she would say before she gave she would give me a task and she would be like she would sit next to me and she would teach me until I said and I had to say okay I got it And then once I said I got it, she was like, okay, so I don't actually want to see you effing this up because if you told me that you got it, like, I don't mind explaining it to you. But when you tell me you got it, I trust that you got it. So tell me when you've actually learned it so that I can delegate things properly to you. So that was one thing that you can say that you don't know, but then you need to be willing to learn and you have to take accountability for being like, okay, I've learned that. And the other thing was, I was th- saying like, we, I had to do menial tasks, right? I was an intern. That was my first office, like proper office job. I had done like other 
odd jobs here and there, but you don't have a proper office job usually before. <laughs> so I had to do some random things like at the bank and it's Xerox and figuring out and some forms and picking up the phone to speak to some donors and pass them over and transfer things. And she said to me one day, she said, you know, there's no such thing as a small job because everything is connected here. So if you don't do this, this doesn't happen and this doesn't happen and this doesn't happen. Everything you do, you need to do it as if it's the most important task in the world, because in a way it is, right? Like, uh, and a lot of society works in this way. Like if no one wants to take the trash out of the city, like we're screwed. You'd be like, oh, the trash just magically disappears from my bin every Monday. It's not like that. You know, like there are all these jobs that maybe you don't see or you don't even think about on a daily basis that keep your world going, right? And I think it's the same at work. And when I started working in production in the creative industries, that was so important because I started like from the ground, you know, like being a runner and blah, blah, blah. But I never thought of my position being pointless because I knew that even though I was doing the most stupid job at the, like what people call stupid, I knew that if I wasn't bringing food to people that had been on the set for 12 hours, they would fall apart. You know, like if I didn't have the correct type of batteries at all times when people needed the batteries, like that would disturb a lot of other big things happening. So it doesn't really matter the hierarchy. So you need to treat everyone as if they are all doing the most important job because <laughs> collectively they sort of are. Uh, so those were really, really important lessons that I've had and really good, I think, management strategies as well, because mm. Actually, give people autonomy and ownership of their work, which is in my mind best to work. I mean, I responded very well to that style, especially from a delegation piece. We don't talk about that enough, like the, the way of of delegating and then the feedback loop and giving the confidence and kind of giving them the the responsibility in a way of being like now you are the person that can take this on because you you know you feel like you understand what you need to do next and sometimes you don't think about that we don't even check if not often but I've had in the past managers or people talking to me and I had to realize that I had to tell them have you asked this person if they know what they're doing have you asked them if they know how to use this tool yeah and there's that assumption as well which is kind of like a knowledge gap that we have and the final thing I want to say before I get to the next question is that you made me smile when you talked about um, the smaller jobs and I remember that one of the things that uh, this is a very UK thing, but I used to work for Nando's. So I don't know if you yeah. know. The chicken. chicken. So when I came to the UK, I was working for Nando's as I was pursuing my dream of becoming a music journalist. And um, and people were like, how can you be so excited about delivering this chicken? I was like, it's my job. I get paid to do this. I yeah. am going to deliver the happiness of the chicken to everybody who wants it. So I'm very much, that has been kind of weirdly ingrained to me for, for a very, very long time because I also knew what the end goal was. And even if it was a means to an end, I was like, this is still making a difference and it's still making people's bellies happy. So um, I yeah. love that you mentioned that as and well. And you also learn new, new skills. You learn different things. Like you always learn something from those experiences. So you, you know, everyone has worked a little bit in, re I mean, a lot of us have worked a little bit here and there, like retail or catering, all these odd jobs. But you learn a lot from it. You learn about communication and organization and blah, 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 and being on time and, you know, connecting with other colleagues, all of those things that kind of make up afterwards what how you work as well. And also what type of work you want to do or not do, you know? Very true if you want to interact with people. If actually interacting with people is not something that speaks to you, I think you don't know until you try. And I love that. You talked about learning. I'm going to flip it, flip it on its head. What is something that you unlearned recently, Isabel? And how did it improve either your life unlearned. or your work? Unlearned. unlearned. Life or work, what would that be? Oh, that's hard. I'm trying to learn so many things. I, I mean, I guess the main thing that I've been trying to unlearn for most of my <laughs> life um, is about my... So actually, it's, it's about like relationship with my body and what it is that I put, like how much attention it has. Of course, I was a very sick kid. I have some weird like health conditions and then by the age of 15 16 I developed anorexia and so I'm not gonna say anything like uh 
that I think it's going to worry anyone or like what do you call this like tr trigger trigger right? anyone yeah so but if if you want to put a warning you can but it was it's not I don't in my my experience in anorexia it wasn't like oh and then I had help and then I got healthy and then I never worried about it again you know it has been very much up and down up and down and then in a few years ago I did this new coaching program and it's been really great but it is something that I think in the past year is something that I've become a lot better with of being like, okay, like, you know, not because it's very, it's very easy for you when you're stressed to put all that stress and like try to control what you can control using your body, like trying to then control your body. And my body doesn't like control, especially not it's it, it gets sick a lot and I'm allergic to many things so I get like reactions out of the blue and I don't know what I'm reacting to so like it's it's super annoying for most people around me um but it's about like seeing that like okay this is this doesn't mean that my body's disgusting or that I am fragile or that you know my health sucks and like and my body sucks and everything sucks and I you know like it's removing a bit the value of that of like it has these conditions and that's just the way it is. But that's a big thing. I think anyone that has ever dealt with any type of chronic disease will probably, well, I don't know, but might identify a bit with that of like always having that sort of the back of their mind and like trying to change the dialogue that you have with yourself and how that impacts or doesn't impact your life on a day-to-day -day basis. But that's, first thing I thought of I don't know maybe not as helpful to everybody but no I think it's super helpful and thank you so much for sharing uh, it's good actually for people as you say we don't know who's going to resonate with but it will resonate with some people and all of these things our relationship with our mind our body my relationship with my mind has always been something at the back of my head pun intended yeah. um you know they affect also how we show up on the day to day the confidence the energy that we have in so many ways so because it's how we talk to ourselves and, and that conversation is one of the gazillion conversations that we have. So it's super relevant. And thank you so much for sharing that as well, because even talking about it and voicing it can be good, but also, you know, even in the catharsis of it, it's still going back to it. So that's a great thing to, I find personally as well, some of these things we are constantly, as you say, unlearning and finding yeah. new ways to unlearn and then kind of catching ourselves so, you know, it's a very good one to be reminded of. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and now, and now, we're time for quick fire. So we got, okay. class in session is over. It's quick fire. I'm going to give you options of a few things. And you're going to have to choose which one to keep with the this or that. Are we ready? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I already know the first one. I'm going. Actually, I don't, but I think I do. <clears throat> Spotify playlist or podcast? Spotify playlist. Okay, I knew that one. Voice note or text? Voice note. Nice. Carousels or reels? To create or to see? Good point. Uh, let's go with to create first. To create carousels for sure. Which I think I knew. To consume? Uh, if it's comedy, reels are really good. But it's... <laughs> It's very hard for me to stop it. So it's, it's like then I can't just scroll. And that, so yeah, I have I do I definitely need I have all the like checks and balances of the phone, so I stop. I don't ever work with my phone next to me, by the way. It's always like somewhere else if I'm working. Because if I go in, I'm lost. Because as I mentioned, my feed is very curated to only make me addicted to funny stuff, you know. So as if there's nothing to watch on TV, I'm like, okay, I can look at my phone for 10 minutes because that would be hilarious. So actually with that in mind, TikTok or YouTube? Oh, YouTube. I'm a YouTube girly. Nice. Uh, what, what kind of YouTube then before I jump to the final one? Honestly, again, my YouTube is, if you go on my YouTube homepage, it's going to be like some stuff from like Vox and the School of Life, a bunch of climbing videos because I really got into that in the beginning of the year. Uh, some random stuff like the Mattel Lane specials. Uh, I don't know, She Can Shop Date, Watch What Happens Live, which is a Bravo thing. So it's a mix. 
And, That's and a I also, good mix. I also really like so like there's I I I follow some some Brazilian channels that are like the history of I don't know religion like or how this word came to be like some really I really like watching that usually like late at night history stuff <laughs> I love that I don't know this is like a little peek inside your brain I'm I'm obsessed with this I love it yeah. Uh, <laughs> My final this or that question, which I think I know the answer for again, is uh, memes or gifs. Oh no, that is so hard. That's like choosing between my babies. Uh, but I'm gonna say, <laughs> but I'm gonna say memes. I'm gonna say memes. I I still think the word, like the written word, has in the way it's used has more impact, and I think it's also really hard to do really hard to be that expressive and that funny in such short sentences true so true actually it's it's, it's a bigger <laughs> challenge i like that um isabel thank you so much before i let you tell us a bit more about where the people can find out more about you uh i'm gonna ask you one more question and this is a uh, power i'm gonna give you a power okay as well okay. you currently have the power to broadcast one message onto everybody's phone and if you did that what would that message say? Like random people or like yeah, anyone. Everybody, literally everybody. I literally tell everyone to go out and go meet someone for a coffee face to face. Like for, for a bit. I feel like we've been losing a lot of connection. Forget that people are people and just go do that. Go connect with someone. Um, oh. I think it's a good networking strategy, like for network branding messages. But I really do think that like when you get out of your own head a little bit, talk to someone and just do that. Just don't say, just don't watch, don't watch friends. Like go and see a friend. It's better for you. I love that. That's actually a good one. I love that. Isabel, thank you so much. Thank you, obviously, again, for all the work that you do. Um, thank you so much for, thank you for somehow having being willing really to enter fun. my world. This is difficult. I have to think. You did great. There is Thank honestly you. no expectation. It's all about coming in <laughs> and sharing whatever comes into that beautiful head, which worked really well. If people want to find out more about you and online networking, remind them again where they should go. So online networking is a career platform. We have our website, so it's onlinenetworking.uk. Over there, you'll find links to all of our socials, our newsletter is I think the best way to be in touch with us directly is where we send the most amount of stuff. And we're going to have some updates there soon as well. So, and then we have our Instagram account, which is the most active of our social media. And it's with the memes. I line up working with the memes. And yeah, you get to see a little bit of my amazing meme selection. <laughs> if I could, I would just post memes all day, but that's not very helpful. So maybe, maybe a second account one day. Uh, yeah. So that's where you can find me. And if you go to Wild Networking, we also have our LinkedIn page and then you can find my personal, well, my normal LinkedIn page as Isabella Sachs. And if you want to reach out there, I usually write about the issues in diversity and inclusion and access in the creative industries and sometimes some other fun stuff as well. But I talk a lot about that. Um, so yeah, you can come connect with me over there if you so wish to network more i love that well <laughs> thank you so much isabel and one more time dear listener thank you please remember to be kind to yourself and others and remember yes i know that true marketing speaks to hearts not just minds and until next time class dismissed